participation. Tonight, Tom Guthrie and Dr. Christine Skelly from MSU Extension will present behavioral-based horse management. Since 1995, Dr. Christine Skelly has served as the State Equine Specialist for Michigan State University Extension. She is the founder and director of My Horse University and coordinates the Michigan 4-H Proud Equestrian Program, a county-based therapeutic riding program that serves youth across Michigan. As an associate professor, Dr. Skelly teaches equine nutrition and farm management in the MSU Development of Animals Department of Animal Science and serves on both the departmental and college diversity, equity, and inclusion committees. Tom Guthrie is a statewide equine extension educator for Michigan State University, based at the Jackson County MSU Extension Office. Tom's role is to develop and provide statewide accessibility to educational programming within the Michigan equine industry. Tom's extension efforts for the equine industry focus on environmental management, on horse farms, pasture management, toxic plant identification, and general equine management. Welcome Tom and Christine. You're muted, Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Strakota. It's great to be with you guys tonight on our very last uh, equine health uh, webinar series for uh, this, this season. Um, and so today, uh, Tom and I are going to discuss with y'all uh, some behavioral uh, uh, management considerations, uh, particularly when uh, you're looking at housing horses, uh, turning horses out on pasture, or feeding horses. So that'll be the focus of our work tonight. So it's really important to uh, consider the behavior of the horse um, as we do our day-to-day -day management routine with horses. Obviously, we need to know about horse behavior uh, if we're training horses, riding horses, but even if we're just uh, you know, cleaning out their stall, putting them in stalls, putting them in the pasture, we really need to understand uh, the behavioral science behind the, uh, those practices, um, those daily practices to make sure that we're offering our horses uh, the best uh, welfare that we can. So uh, we're gonna keep this fairly low key, pretty simple, and, and we're gonna be jumping on top of each other you know, as we talk. So um, uh, feel free to put your questions in our Q&A box as we move forward with tonight's presentation. But horses basically evolved uh, as plains dwellers. Um, so if we, if we think about you know, what their life entails out in the wild, uh, they, are, they are the prey. Right, so um, uh, this uh, this is uh, very important as far as how they're designed. Um, if we uh, if we think about their their senses uh, from a sight perspective, uh, they can see they pretty much have a panoramic view around them because their eyes are on the side of the head. However, they have limited vision uh, directly in front of them, so they have to raise and lower their head uh, to see things directly or to focus on things with both of their eyes at the same time directly in front of them. And then they have a blind spot directly behind them, but they have this ability to see from side to side without even moving their head. Um, they have pretty acute hearing so they can hear things along the trail that we can't, their sense of smell is enhanced. Uh, and some strange smells, like I've always noticed, if horses haven't been around donkeys, um, they might get really excited if they smell donkeys or, or hogs or something like that. So they're very sensitive to, um, to new smells. Uh, they're, they have a really acute sense of touch, and obviously we use that when we're, uh, when we're working with them. And then uh, from a taste standpoint, that comes into play with how we feed them. But by far, 
their instinct uh, to act as a prey animal and run like crazy at the first sign of danger is, is really, really important to how we uh, house them and put them out in pasture and whatnot. Uh, so we really wanna take that into play. Uh, they also have a little bit of a fight response and usually we see that more with horse to horse interactions, but sometimes if you corner a horse and they get feeling a little trapped, uh, they will instinctively kick or bite or you know try to paw to get out of that situation. But uh, we'll just show this uh, quick little video. Uh, this is a one of our MSU horses uh, walking over a tarp uh, or attempting to walk over a tarp for the first time. You can see the investigative behavior there. And then the flight response kicks in pretty quickly. Now, you know, lucky, luckily for this uh, horse and handler, uh, they've worked together before. Uh, this horse knows that if I am going to react, I'm not going to uh, run over the handler and comes back to the handler really quickly. So, um, but that I think is just a, and this horse does within a couple of tries, walks over very easily over the tarp. But that first reaction kind of displays what we're working with uh, when we house horses. Uh, the other thing about horses is that we want to keep in mind is they're extremely social animals. Uh, so the behaviors they exhibit within a herd are uh, caregiving type behaviors. And um, uh, this, uh, if you look at the uh, mirror and full bond, uh, that's really indicative of care, caregiving by the mare, care seeking by the foal. Um, they can also be, especially the younger horses, uh, very playful. Um, and uh, they will mimic each other. Um, but also within a herd, they may become very vigilant. So usually if you have a herd of horses out in the wild, you'll have one horse that's kind of watching over, kind of at high alert, looking around, listening, smelling, uh, looking for anything suspicious. And then that horse will actually, you know, by, by you know, raising their head, running, uh, will signal to the other horses, danger, danger, let's get out of here. So they will actually run as a group. Another part of uh, the horse herd though is the dominance hierarchy. So you have, uh, your kind of alpha horses, and then you have the horses at the very end of the dominance hierarchy order, order that are going to be the last ones, if we're talking about a domestic herd, the last ones to get to the, to the grain bin, or maybe the, the one that isn't allowed into the uh, shed. So you can see this horse <laughs> at the bottom of the screen kind of guarding this little uh, run, run in shed. So uh, this is not a very well designed run in shed because one horse can dominate uh, that little run in shed. So if there's three other horses in this uh, pasture, and this horse doesn't want those horses to come inside, they're not going to be able to come inside. So thinking through some of our routine management uh, systems uh, will help us to make sure that, you know, everybody's invited to the table, uh, per se. Um, the other thing, because horses are such social animals, when we do things like isolate them from other horses, we can start to see some abnormal behaviors. And Tom's going to talk a little bit more about that um, as we get into our presentation. And when we're talking about abnormal behaviors, some of these abnormal behaviors could be characterized as a stereotypy. And these are repetitive behaviors that are performed with basically no obvious or discernible function. Uh, one example of this would be flank biting. So you can see a picture of this horse. Um, and this horse uh, was actually an orphaned foal at our MSU horse farm uh, uh, within fairly young age. I think he was seven when he colicked uh, and uh, had to be put down, but this horse was very stressed all of his life. And one of the ways he handled some of the stress 
was to bite a splink. Um, and there was not any way, turnout, nothing, training, nothing would uh, get this horse to stop biting a splink. There's other undesirable behaviors though that aren't necessarily a stereotypy, um, like biting, kicking, rearing, wood chewing that may have actual uh, rationales and it makes sense for the horses to be exhibiting that uh, behavior even though we don't care for it. Um, risk factors of abnormal behaviors include, like we just discussed, isolation, uh, having limited to no turnout, a low forage diet, just stress. So that's one of the reasons if you look at racehorses, the majority of racehorses may actually show to have uh, ulcers. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of genetics. So you may have horses that are predisposed because of the way they're bred uh, to exhibit a certain behavior like cribbing. Um, but sometimes you can, if you uh, give that horse plenty of turnout, low stress uh, life and uh, a lot of forage, then you may never see that horse actually exhibit that behavior. So uh, we will move forward here. So I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Tom for a little bit. Thank you, Dr. Skelly, I appreciate it. Um, and if you have anything to add while I'm going through this slide set, please feel free to, to jump in. So we'll talk a little bit here about time budgets. Um, behaviorists will use a time budget to show how an animal breaks up its day into various behavioral activities. And one example of research done on free ranging horses, also known as feral horses, the horses spent nearly half the day engaged in for foraging or grazing. A mere 8% of the day was spent lying down. Other time budget studies in the past have shown domestic horses grazing from 10 to 17 hours with as much as 50% of the grazing occurring at night. So if you look at this slide, here we have two pie charts comparing free ranging horses versus stable horses. Um, a Michigan State University study conducted by Haleski and coworkers in 2002 used, utilized quarter horse weanlings and time budgets were calculated for these weanlings housed in stables versus weanlings, weanlings housed in outdoor paddocks. As you can see, we have some very varying differences here um, when we look at feeding time. So 45.2% for free ranging horses compared to only 29.1% for horses that were stable. And what's really interesting is you look at the, and, or compare the time these horses spent lying down. So if you look at the free ranging horses, 8.3 compared to 21.2% of the time that those stabled horses were lying down. Although it is unclear why these horses lay down more, we can hypothesize that is possibly because of boredom. So if your horse is primarily kept in a stall, one to two hours of exercise is a suggested minimum standard uh, to strive for. Okay, Chris, next slide. So when we look at stalling considerations, um, Dr. Dr. Skelly already mentioned that horses are very social creatures. So if we really hone in on what the horse can see, what the horse can hear, that would be auditory, and then olfactory, what the horse can smell. So as you can see in the pictures that we have illustrated here, the top picture where those horses have run in, it looks, appear to be stalls, right? They can shut the stall door, but if they're outside, they have contact or they can see, smell the other horse. Um, if you look at the picture at the bottom, um, it has a wire front um, stall front. This enables the horse to see more. In addition to that, it also can increase ventilation within your barn, right? So those horses that are standing in there get a little better airflow potentially. And so you wanna make sure that you give them plenty of room to lay down, turn around, um, so on and so forth. Next slide, Chris. So if we look at 
some spatial requirements. So for housing, as far as ceiling height, right, we're looking at um, about a 10 foot minimum. For riding purposes, 12 feet, and for jumping, it would be 15 feet. As far as space requirement goes, a lot of times you will hear, you know, the basic stall dimensions are 10 by 10 for a smaller stall, 10 by 12 for medium, and a 12 by 12 for a larger stall. Okay. And this may be dependent on what size horse you have and how long that horse may actually be being stalled. And then we want to double those um, spaces for foaling mares and stallions. So if we can put removable partitions in the stall, it just makes it a little more efficient to use, uh, utilize our resources. Next slide, Chris. So as with everything, there are advantages and disadvantages to all things, right? And so if we look at these pictures where the horses have open access from, from stalls, okay? Um, Obviously the advantage here, the horses are able to see one another, okay, and socialize, but there can be some issues with this type of, of system, right? Um, if you have a horse that has aggressive behavior, that essentially can be a liability in a public farm, okay? Uh, there have been times where I've, I've visited farms and walking by and not paying attention and that horse, you know, has reached out to try to nip at me or whatever the case may be, right? So those are things that we need to be kind of aware of. You might see some, quote, goofy behavior from horses, you know, heads up and down, side to side, um, just try, maybe even trying to get your attention. Um, chewing, if you look at the bottom left-hand corner picture, right, that's a really nice ledge um, that a horse could potentially decide to start chewing on. And then with younger horses, okay, they may challenge that opening. They might think, well, hey, I can get out of this place, right? Um, so as I mentioned, there are advantages and disadvantages just about to everything. Next slide, Chris. Okay, if you wanna go ahead and play that video. So if we look at weaving, okay, the definition is a horse that weaves will shift weight between its front legs um, repeatedly in an exaggerated manner, okay? Um, the negative effects of this, it's hard on the hooves and legs, it's hard to main, uh, maintain proper weight, and you may essentially see some, some stall ruts. So most horse experts agree that managing horses so they can spend more time doing what comes natural to them like eating, forage, free exercise, helps prevent health and behavioral problems. While housing certainly isn't the only cause of the stereotypic behavior, most equine behaviorists um, believe the ways horses are housed and allowed to exhibit normal behavior play a significant role in changes of developing stereotypies, okay? We move on and we're looking at wood chewing. Um, wood chewing, a horse that chews on wood can be very annoying to an owner. But this behavior can be thought as a natural behavior, behavior actually. Horses that are bored or receive insufficient amounts of forage may chew on wood. So horses prefer soft wood such as pine boards and young tree bark over harder woods. It is very natural for a horse, especially in the wild, okay, to take in some of their calories for subsistence by eating bark and other parts of a tree, particularly in winter months. We look at tail chewing. Um, in tail chewing, a horse chews on a, herd's, on a herd mate's tail, causing unsightly appearance, okay? This action may be a result of a low fiber diet or boredom. It is also common for a foal to chew the dam's tail. Usually tail chewing can be remedied by providing free choice forage. I put electrical in here too, as well. So if a horse is chewing on or through electrical wires, the outcome could be fatal, obviously. Um, not to mention the risk of, of 
of fire risk associated with such behavior. So one thing that we need to remember here is that horses are, are hardwired to chew, okay? So therefore, lack of fiber in their diet, boredom, and confinement may all contribute to wood chewing. Next slide, Chris. So a potential solution to that for that social aspect, all right? So we, we kind of focused on individual housing, indoor housing, um, but you can also group house indoors. And this is more common in Europe and it increases the opportunity for natural social interaction, even indoors, right? So those horses have contact with one another. Um, space requirements for this uh, would be about 150 square feet per horse indoors. Um, you just wanna make sure that they have ample space to eat, uh, lie down, um, be able to avoid confrontation. And this type of of system may work best uh, for stable groups, okay? Those horses are familiar and know one another. So if we move on to outdoor housing, okay? Um, this is a very common question I get frequently is how much pasture does it take uh, to pasture a horse, okay? And so in general terms, you need at least two acres per horse if it's for, to sustain that horse as far as nutritional nutritionally goes, okay? It may be a little bit more if, you're, if your land base has a sandy soil, okay? But about two acres per horse. Um, but there are some bene uh, behavioral benefits um, for housing horses outside. Um, there was a study done by Rivera and, and colleagues uh, with two-year-olds that were housed out on pasture. Um, and they compared them to two-year-olds that were stalled. And they found that the two-year-olds housed out on pasture were more trainable um, than, than the two-year-olds that were stalled. Basically, comes down to the horses that were, that were housed outdoors were less reactive to things. Next slide, Chris. So let's take a look at run-in sheds. Okay, um, benefits of running sheds for shelter. There's fresh air, you get protection from the weather, and it's relatively easy up, upkeep, okay? Uh, spatial requirements here, 150 square feet per horse. Um, keep in mind that you, you wanna build, if you're gonna build one, build it on a high spot. The base materials will be similar um, as a stall. All right, we don't want to build. We don't want to build it or locate your running shed in the low spot of a pasture or area where, you know, it floods or water um, accumulates. And then you can see that you can get as fancy or as basic as you wish. Right? I mean, if you look at the picture down below on the far left, uh, this this running shed actually has an overhang which helps with you know, um, preventing some of that rain or snow, making it a muddy mess on the inside of, of the run-in shed. But I would like to draw your attention um, to the posts of these respective run-in sheds. If you look at those posts, okay, the posts are typically four by four, okay, and they can have sharp corners. So a preventative safety measure um, for this would be to wrap these posts to protect horses from being injured by running into the corners of the post, or even could potentially deter wood chewing, okay? And so a simple fix for this is it can be simply done by wrapping the posts in something like that corrugated drain tubing that you see, okay? And that just kind of, you know, it prevents a, or it gives a round edge. If a horse bumps into it, it's not going to be as Hard is bumping into the corner of one of those posts. And also the horse does not have access to chew on it. Next slide, Chris. Okay, so here is a picture that I captured when recently visiting a farm, okay? Uh, this res respective scenario goes back to some of the social and herd behavior that Dr. Skelly previously discussed. 
as you can see, it is winter time and it, and it was relatively cold that day. But I want you to take note of the location of the run-in shelters. We can see that we have fencing down the middle, okay, and where those horses are standing. So as you can see, the horses are standing in somewhat of a group, right, that, that social interaction, almost directly in the middle of the pasture, right, uh, area where the, where the fence is separating the two pasture groups. So out of curiosity, um, I inquired with the farm manager about how often the horses utilize the run-in sheds and if the run-in sheds were movable. The answer was they rarely utilize the sheds and the sheds were not movable because the posts were concreted in the ground, okay? So the farm manager did mention though that the horses in the pasture on the left, okay, are typically found standing underneath a tree that stands adjacent to a hillside that serves as a natural wind block from prevailing winds. The farm manager also noted that the horses in the pasture on the right, okay, will typically stand under the evergreen trees in inclement weather. So while it is very important that the horses have free choice to utilize a provided shelter or not utilize it, it is important to consider how horses may or may not utilize the provided resources. Otherwise, if they are rarely or never getting used in some way, okay, it could be an expensive waste of resources. With this respective scenario, a possible consideration would be to move both of those run-in sheds kind of closer to the middle of the pastures where the horses may potentially utilize them more. Next slide, Chris. So let's talk a little bit about grazing behavior. So given the opportunity, horses will ingest many different species of plants per day, but they are selective grazers. In a pasture with multiple types of forage, they often will eat what is um, present according to their preference and may avoid certain species altogether. Debbie Goodwin of the UK has experimented with horses being offered multiple species of forage. The, res the results of Dr. Goodwin's research show that horses do have a preference for ingesting multiple forage species per day. So in general, grazing horses prefer grasses to legume species, such as alfalfa in a pasture, but it's just the opposite of what you typically might find when feeding horses forage species in the hay form. So there are many factors that can influence grazing behavior. One could be palatability of forages, okay? Horses will prefer to graze less mature plants and preferred plant species, oftentimes creating what can be referred to as lawns, okay, in a pasture where the, where the grass is really short. Older horses may graze longer than younger horses and mares may graze longer than stallions. Weather conditions can also have an impact, such as adverse um, conditions and extreme temperatures. If there's a lot of wind and rainfall, that can limit grazing. Um, external parasites, like biting flies, mosquitoes, and ticks may potentially limit grazing time. And then herd interaction. So a herd of horses will spend more time grazing than a horse grazing alone. If we look at um, toxic plants, a well-fed well horse, if they have access to desirable forage, typically will not ingest toxic plants while foraging, but there is no guarantee, okay? Horses will also avoid grazing in areas that have manure buildup. So if you're dealing with a small pasture, horses tend to defecate in a localized area and this creates a localized area of manure where horses will refuse to graze, also typically referred to as the roughs, right? So we've got the lawns, very short, and we've got the roughs where they're defecating um, and they typically will not graze there. So as you look over your pasture, the area um, will probably, with the taller, taller grass, that will probably tell you the, the horses, where the horses choose to defecate. Okay, next, next slide, Chris. 
So if we look at eliminative behavior, okay, that refer, refers to the voiding of feces and urine. Some horses will eliminate everywhere, okay, while others may have a more defined areas in which they will eliminate. Stallions in particular will defecate on other horse feces piles, fecal piles, usually after smelling them. So in larger pastures, horses will choose defecation and sometimes urination areas that they will use for elimination only and avoid grazing. So you can kind of see that in the top, the top picture that we have here, right? Okay, if they're in that pasture most of the time or all of the time, they'll choose those specific areas. If you're managing horses on small acreage, um, identify the areas in your pastures that are typically used for elimination. This section where the grass is much taller than the rest of the pasture. If you want to increase the utilization of this area for grazing, you will need to mow uh, that section and break up the manure piles with a harrow or drag, okay? By breaking up the manure piles on hot, dry days for sun exposure will also help with parasite control. So if you look at the bottom here, the bottom picture, we, we have like four little different areas, right? And so that, that kind of simulates a rotational grazing type of system. If those horses are out on a rotational grazing type of system, we kind of can control uh, those elimination areas, right? And make it more uniform across the pasture area. Next slide, Chris. So <clears throat> we talked about pastures and there may be some times that you need to keep horses off the pastures, okay? Um, if the grazing area is small, horses can eat the grass right down to the bare surface, okay? And that can create a dangerous situation on sandy soils since a horse can ingest sand and fall back. Hey, uh, Julia, is, is that Tom or is it me? That is Tom. I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to take over for a few minutes until his uh, signal comes back. Um, yeah, so um, as Tom was saying, uh, during drought conditions especially, horses can graze really, really close. Um, and uh, during wet conditions too, they can be very, very destructive to pastures just because of their hoof tread. And you can see, you know, a horse gets excited, runs around, and uh, they end up um, uh, just really digging up your pasture. Um, another thing, if, if you've newly seeded a pasture, you don't want horses uh, running on it or trying to grab that newly grown grass when it's so short, because they'll just rip it right out of the uh, soil. So one good rule of thumb is don't let your, fo your forage height uh, get any lower than three inches, preferably four inches. Uh, once uh, your pasture gets uh, that low, uh, then you want to consider moving them someplace else that they're obviously not going to destroy uh, your pasture land. Um, so one thing that we uh, work with uh, horse owners a lot in is just developing what we call uh, sacrifice lots or holding pens. And this is just a space where you can put your horses in when it's uh, rainy outside, when the maybe during the spring when you don't want them to have easy access to too much spring grass, um, or if they tend to overeat, you can put them in a sacrifice lot. Um, and uh, as you're trying to decide where your sacrifice lot should be, you wanna consider the slope of your land. Uh, you want to consider um, how well that lot is going to be drained because ideally you don't have any uh, green in that lot. And here's the reason why. If you have just a little bit of uh, kind of that green weedy clovery stuff, you know, horses will still try to eat that. And as they're eating that, they're also going to be grabbing a mouthful of sand, which can lead to sand colic. Um, 
So Tom, glad to have you back. Uh, we just talked a little bit about uh, sacrifice lots, and uh, I think we're at the fencing bullet, if you want to take over from there. Okay, I appreciate that. I sure. stayed in my office tonight, so I didn't have internet connections. And it's so weird that the lights kind of flickered, and it just totally kicked me <laughs> off of everything. And I'm like, go figure, right? I, I stay late to the office, and then, then it actually happens. So anyway, okay. So you've already talked about this slide, Chris. Thanks for picking up for me. You're on mute. I can't hear you. If you want to talk maybe a little bit about the fencing of the dry lot and waste removal and feed and water, that would be great. Yeah. So, I mean, when you're looking at the amenities of, of a dry lot area, right, um, you just need to be able to provide shelter, a place to feed them, access to water, obviously. Okay. And then I'm sure Dr. Skelly had mentioned that. You know, and that in this type of situation with a dry lot, okay, you don't want any vegetation there. Okay, that's the purpose of the sacrifice or holding pen. All right, uh, to to keep those horses off pasture. However, if we allow things to start growing, um, there is potential that we could get some toxic weeds um, growing in there, and then we don't want the horses consuming. So, if you can go to the next slide, Chris, please. Okay, so here, um, one, th one thing to remember, okay, if there's adequate desirable forage available, a horse typically will not eat toxic plants while foraging, but there is no guarantee to that. So if we look at these two pictures here, okay, we look at the picture of the characters on the left, it appears they may be up to something, right? Okay, they're all standing there together. But if you look closely, there are a couple of weeds that are present there, okay? Not sure what the weed is, but the potential is there for consumption. So if, if you're in a dry lot situation, if it's meant to be a dry lot, make sure there's no vegetation. If you look at the video on the right that's now playing, you'll see a gelding that will purposely graze around Coriolisum. Coriolisum is a toxic plant that causes stocking up in the legs of horses. And that can be toxic in the fresh form or in the hay, in the dry form, such as in hay. But you can see that this gelding actually has access to other desirable forage there that he's preferring to eat. And he kind of grazes right around the horiolism plant, okay? Um, now, as we got farther into the summer, this situation, um, you know, the horses weren't turned out as often as, as they were in the spring because the desirable forage was not available. Okay, next slide, Chris. Okay, so remember that in free ranging horses, um, time budget, almost 50% of the time was spent grazing. So a horse's eating preference is to forage the majority of the day. Horses will usually take a few bites at one location and walk a few steps to another location while chewing. This is a picture of horses being fed in the wintertime with snow cover, okay? As you can see, hay piles are spread in a line throughout, which allows these horses to kind of meander from pile to pile. There are more horses here that are, that are out of frame, but this type of situation allows them to kind of move along find their pile of forage and essentially eliminates a horse being left out of a place to eat, okay? And surprisingly, the horse has spent, they must have spent majority of the, of the night cleaning all of the little off falls of their piles up because there was not a whole lot left uh, from this situation. Okay, and then finally, on the left-hand side, there's a small picture, um, that has my hand on the side of a horse that was allowed to grow its winter coat, okay? As you can see, my fingers are almost covered up by the length of the hair. At times, we as humans tend to be overprotective of our horses, especially in wintertime when it's cold, which is completely understandable, okay? But we need to remind ourselves 
that a horse has natural defenses, such as a thick winter coat to protect it from the cold weather. So therefore, we should, we should make the best attempt to let our horses be, hor be horses as much as possible. Next slide, Chris. So the final slide I'm gonna to talk to you about is fencing. And unfortunately, there's no such thing as a perfect horse fence, okay? Some types have a definite advantage over others, but in most cases, there are trade-offs, okay, that have to be made in order to reach sort of practical solution, okay? Um, however, there's one area in which you cannot afford much compromise, and that is safety, okay? There are two main aspects of safety when it comes to horse fencing. First one, keeping horses safe and contained, right? That's the purpose of the fence. And then two, keeping people safe. Each of these as aspects carry its own considerations, right? So keeping horses safe requires you um, to successfully contain horses so they don't get out and wander into potentially dangerous situations, okay? Ensure that the horse not only sees the fence, but also respects it. And then also we were gonna to try to reduce injuries when the horses do make contact with the fence. On the keeping people safe side of things, that involves making sure horses can't get loose and possibly cause injury, and then keeping people out of horse areas that they don't belong, okay? In the picture on the left, you can see that the fence posts are located on the outside, okay? This creates a more durable structure in case the horse runs into it, okay? The fence posts, in this case, horse runs into it, fence posts will absorb most of the impact, okay? If it was the other way around, okay, you would be re relying more on the staples or nails to hold the fence together, okay? And you might find that horses will test it. They'll push against it, okay, to see how sturdy it is, okay? And with the, with the fence posts on the outside, it, it also prevents um, horses from potentially rubbing on the fence post. On the picture on the right, you'll notice that there's a diamond mesh fence, okay? And this is a stallion paddock, okay? And you can see that that fence is about seven foot high, okay? And so if you have a public barn or area and if you have stallions, okay, that diamond mesh fence may work a little better. It's a little harder to get your fingers or arms through, all right, if somebody wants to reach out. But, you know, if you can double fence the area where your stallions are, if you do have stallions, it's just uh, another safety precaution. So Chris, with that, I will turn it over to you and I apologize for my absence during the power outage. Thanks, Tom. Um, so now we're gonna talk about uh, ingestive behavior, really just uh, the behavior of horses eating and drinking. Uh, so, we are going to come back to our time budget uh, that we talked about uh, early on and just compare wild horses to domestic or stabled horses. So out in the wild, again, we expect horses to graze between 12 and 18 hours. Um, and this is, they're, they're taking in a pretty much poor to medium quality forage as they graze. So not, none of our enriched fertilized pastures for them. Uh, the other uh, thing we want to keep in mind is there's no access to grain out in the wild. Um, so, and this works really well with the horse's digestive system, having a really small stomach um, and uh, a, 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 a hindgut that's built for uh, fermentation of forage material. Um, and then from uh, a standpoint of nutritional needs, uh, our horses out in the wild uh, need nutrition just for day-to-day -day maintenance, you know, do all of their activities that are associated with staying alive. Uh, if they're young, they need uh, energy for, and protein for growth. And if they are um, uh, nursing, uh, then they need uh, energy for, uh, to produce milk. If we compare that to our stabled horses, though, or domestic horses, grazing time varies, right? It, it's very dependent on what we actually allow those horses to do. 
forage quality, that's that's another, you know, we're not quite sure, but if we are uh, putting together, you know, pasture seed and fertilizing our pastures, which usually we have to do, uh, their uh, perspective uh, uh, grass that their or forage quality is going to be, you know, medium to the high side. Um, and uh, a lot of horses have uh, access to grain. I, I know people that when I tell them their horses don't need grain, they look at me like I'm the meanest person in this whole wide world, right? Uh, so we'll see horses, you know, eating anywhere from 25 to 50% of their diet uh, in grain. And the only difference then that our domestic horses have versus the wild horses is we're asking them to do something. We're usually asking them to work for us, right? Uh, if we're exercising them or driving them or whatever. So uh, that leads us to what are their forage requirements? Um, Typically, when I talk about nutrition to horse owners, I'm really pushing the forage. I figure there's plenty of feed companies out there that are going to tell you what type of grains to buy. I'm going to push those forages. And uh, invariably, uh, most horses will need to take in about one and a half to three percent of their body weight in dry matter intake. So if we're feeding a thousand pound horse, um, they're usually going to take in between 15 to 20 pounds of hay a day. Now, if we're talking about forage, we have to add all the water that, uh, that's uh, into uh, or pasture. We have to add all the water into that. So that would be about 80 pounds of uh, pasture. That's why you see your grasses get really short really, really quick because horses have to consume a lot uh, to equal the dry matter of hay. Um, mature horses should be getting, you know, at least then 1.5% of their forage, uh, of, of their dietary intake in forage, um, each day. Uh, that means that a thousand pound horse, uh, will go through a 60 pound bale of hay in about three days. So you can kind of plan on that when you're planning on buying your hay. Um, forage uh, should make at least, uh, you know, in the old days, we used to say 50% of the total ration, but the reality, I think, uh, with veterinarians and uh, nutritionists, our horses, uh, if you can, should really get at least 75% of their diet fed and forage. That could either be pasture or hay, depending on the horse and depending on how they're being housed. Um, most of our adult horses that are either our pasture pets or light work can do really, really well on a forage diet. So if we look at our pyramid, you know, our food pyramid for horses, you know, the base of that is going to be in forage. Um, and then if they need um, uh, some nutrition after that, a lot of nutrition, say you have a lactating broodmare, she may need uh, more grain supplemented in her diet. But a lot of horses, you can skip this grain and just go right to uh, a vitamin mineral kind of your, you know, one a day kind of uh, mineral vitamin mineral mix for your horses, just to make sure that you're feeding a good nutritious balanced diet. The other thing that's uh, great in our horse industry these days are the uh, ration balancers, or sometimes they're referred to as hay balancers, uh, where you can make sure you balance the forage uh, with just your vitamins, minerals, and protein uh, in the horse's diet. So horses, we think about, you know, what's palatable? What do they like to eat? And basically, horses are a lot like people. They like uh, sweet and salty <laughs> uh, from a taste standpoint. From a texture standpoint, they're going to avoid that hard, coarse, prickly type feeds. That's one reason they'll uh, kind of uh, gravitate away from, um, uh, from uh, uh, toxic plants. Um, because they have a pretty acute smell, uh, they can pretty easily identify um, uh, medications, even moldy hay. And if they um, have something else to eat, 
they'll uh, usually kind of drift away from that moldy hay. They don't like a bitter taste at all. Um, so th those are some things uh, that we know about horses and uh, what they want to eat. Horses cannot, though, think about it and balance their own diet. So they have no nutritional wisdom. So it's kind of a wise tale to think that a horse is just going to go find what they need nutritionally. Um, they can't select. If you, if you put out you know, a bunch of different uh, mineral or vitamin supplements uh, in a feeder, they're not going to select and eat how much they need of each one. We have to kind of balance that diet for them and then feed it to them. The one thing horses will do is overeat, okay, especially your ponies um, and uh, a few of your breeds, but we, we know that overeating in horses leads to metabolic disorders, and uh, this can be a lifelong problem for some of our equine. So it's really important then that we monitor their body condition score. And uh, Julie, I'm going to have you, uh, if you can grab that one link, uh, I've got a um, we're putting some links in the chat for you guys, uh, but there's one link that'll take you uh, to the body condition score scale. But basically we wanna keep our horses, no matter if they're housed in stalls or outside, in this kind of moderate body condition score, average body condi condition score. So if we have a body condition score of one being the thinnest horse, and then nine being the fattest horse, we want to try to keep most of our horses right in this green range of a moderate condition score. And so some of the reasons are if a horse is really thin, let's say under a four, okay, we're going to see obviously a reduced performance. Uh, these horses will actually lose their muscle mass because now their body has no fat to depend for energy and they have to start breaking down muscle tissue or their protein in their body uh, just to maintain their life. You'll see a decreased reproductive efficiency. And then if you have a young growing horse, the growth will basically stop uh, if they're really under nutrition. Um, and then with our really overweight horses, uh, body condition score over six, uh, we have increased risk of laminitis, uh, other metabolic issues as well, um, increased leg injuries, especially with our young growing horses. You know, we can't put that much weight on this on their growing joints. Um, they're more apt to succumb to heat stress, and we'll see a reduced performance with those horses as well. So as we move forward, then um, you know, one thing we want to look at, look for when we're feeding horses is going back to that um, uh, herd uh, hierarchy. Um, you know, there's good things about the pecking order in horses um, is once it's established, it kind of prevents fights within a herd. Um, however, uh, it may cause one horse to get really heavy or fat and other horses to get really thin if they're constantly being left out of the uh, nutritional resources in the field. Um, so I'm just going to play this because uh, it's kind of fun. And I think you'll be able to hear. The mare demonstrates her dominance by getting to the feed tub first. The gelding is submissive to the mare and initially circles the feed tub rather than trying to eat the grain. When the gelding does try to take a bite of grain, the mare snakes out her neck and pins her ears in a threatening manner. The gelding responds to the mare's threatening body language by leaving the feed tub, thus preventing a fight. So those are those were both my horses at the time and I still have the gelding and now he's ruling the roost, so don't feel too sorry for him. But um, that's just a good example. Horses usually don't fight over forage, but they will definitely fight over uh, grain uh, resources. So that's one reason if you are group feeding, you wanna space out your feeders, you wanna monitor your body condition score of all the horses uh, very closely, and you may actually need to start separating out uh, horses that are getting too thin or too fat. 
And uh, another thing uh, with our, our uh, fat horses or horses that do have a metabolic condition, they will definitely overeat that spring grass. That is just so good for that. You know, they're, that's like candy for our horses. Uh, so you want to introduce spring pasture really, really slowly. We always say, you know, 15 to 30 minutes at a time, increasing by 15 to 30 minutes uh, each week. Uh, through the um, early spring season. Um, so with some horses, you may have to do that for this first six to eight weeks of grazing before you can get them acclimated uh, to the new grass. Another thing we can do with our horses uh, before we turn them out to uh, spring grass is to feed them hay prior to grazing so that you can kind of fill up their belly a little bit and maybe they'll be a little less apt to uh, just go in there and eat like crazy. Um, the other thing though that we always suggest is just restrict their grazing with a grazing muscle. Um, and I really, I really like these uh, newer grazing muscles that are a little lighter and airier and easier uh, for horses uh, to get uh, water from as well. Um, but if, if worse comes to worse, you just need to put them in that sacrifice lot and limit their turnout into a uh, fresh pasture. Uh, so here is uh, an example of another uh, stereotypy that we uh, see, and that would be a uh, cribbing type behavior, uh, where horses grab onto an object and they kind of rock back, rock backwards and suck in air. Uh, this can have really negative effects on horses' teeth and gums. Um, a lot of times these horses don't maintain their weight as uh, well. Um, it may actually be a pre predispose them to colic, and it can also be hard on uh, fences and your stall doors and whatnot. Usually we see horses uh, uh, demonstrate cribbing uh, when they've been isolated a lot or they're stressed or if they have a really low forage diet. So those would be some of the risk factors that you, wanna, you want to uh, kind of work uh, to avoid. Coprophagy is another behavior that you might see. Uh, it's very normal in uh, young foals. And basically that's when horses eat their own manure, somebody else's manure, but they're eating manure, which you don't necessarily want to see just from a uh, parasite control uh, issue. But it's very common in normal uh, foals. Uh, some people think, well, maybe they're kind of inoculating their gut with microbes, but eh, I think maybe they're just curious and they're kind of taste testing a lot of things at that age. Um, However, if you see adult horses uh, eating manure, usually it's because they don't have enough fiber in their diet. You know, it'd be better for them for you to toss out some hay in the stall versus them uh, eating their own manure. Um, sometimes it might be an indication of protein deficiency, but in most cases, I would probably uh, rule that it's uh, fiber. Uh, and potentially you may just have horses that are bored enough to where they're gonna eat, eat manure. Uh, but that's another good uh, rationale for getting those horses uh, turned out if you can. Um, we'll just touch on creep feeding uh, our babies. We, uh, Dr. Schott gave an awesome uh, talk uh, a couple of weeks ago about uh, foals and some of the things that can go wrong and go right as well. Uh, but one thing that uh, research shows that if we can uh, gradually wean a horse versus a real abrupt weaning, we might be able to reduce some of the stress associated uh, with the weaning process and young horses. One thing we can do with our, our babies then is to teach them how to eat before we take their mom away. You know, I mean, that's got to be pretty shocking to the system. You're a baby, you're milking, 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 all of a sudden she's gone and you're told to eat all this grain and hay. So rather than to do that abruptly, uh, one thing we can do is uh, let, let these young horses kind of taste test, um, you know, a, a balanced ration, this balance for the young growing horse, 
um, as well as, you know, give them access if, if there's no pasture around, uh, give them access to some high quality hay that they'll actually want to try to try to eat. Get them, you know, eating a little bit before we wean them. And then if you can uh, practice more of a gradual weaning system, like separating the mare and foal through a fence line, uh, maybe that has a wire mesh down the center. Uh, so that they can see each other, they can hear each other, they can even touch noses, but uh, you've broken that nutritional uh, bond there so the, the baby can't nurse the, the mare. And then over time, you'll see both of these horses, uh, you know, start to look at other things and the mares usually drift away before the uh, babies do. Another, another way we wean horses here at MSU is we have our horse herds out together. We throw out an old mare that kind of, you know, as queen, queen bee in, in that pasture. And then one by one, you know, uh, every other day or so, we'll remove one mare. So that baby is still in that same herd, but the mom is gone. Uh, but those babies really acclimate uh, pretty quickly. Um, uh, in that situation. And so by the end of our weaning, uh, the one old mare is still there, just kind of playing nursemaid to all the other uh, weanlings uh, that are out in the pasture. So there's some different routines you can do. The last thing I wanted to talk to you about is orphan foals. This is a huge behavioral problem <laughs> when you have an orphan foal, um, especially if you try to raise an orphan foal in um, in um, uh, a educational type setting, you know, like MSU, where you have all these students and this one orphan full and everybody's, you know, making over this baby. Uh, what you need to do is to try to do a hands-off approach of raising these babies and get them on a, um, a, a bucket of milk as soon as you can so that the people are left out of that whole nutritional um, aspect of uh, raising the foal. And the next thing you can do as well is to give them a buddy, you know, who's, who's going to be pretty tolerant of a young horse so that they can end up an uh, equine buddy. So maybe it's a pony, um, you know, that's about the same size that they can tag along with and learn the ropes. Uh, but as soon as you can, you want to get these babies with other horses, you know, as safely as you can. Maybe if you're really lucky, there's a nurse mare uh, someplace that you can borrow. That's best case scenario, but not always readily available. So just think about if you do end up with an orphan foal, just tie your hands behind your back. Don't be hugging on the baby and, you know, playing with them and all that. Get them out with the horses. Otherwise, you can really end up with some long-term behavioral problems. So with that, I think that is it.